Good afternoon. I suppose we are all here because the tall building has become the dominant building type uh, in the urban landscape. I'd like uh, to go through some of our projects today, but with a particular focus. First, of course, the cultural fit, but also uh, what are the issues that are emerging as tall buildings are clustered and concentrated in uh, more dense groupings? Um, we have a whole conceptual zoning, uh, building codes, urban design tools, which were really invented and focused at the times of individual towers on individual parcels. And I would uh, think that at this point, the issues that are arising out of this concentration of high-rise buildings is introducing uh, problems that we have not faced in the past. Also, much of the focus on tall buildings has been as objects in the urban landscape. What happens when the issues of livability of either housing or the workspace become central uh, rather than treating them more as uh, sculptural elements? And what is the impact on the public realm? In other words, can the tall building become a friendly participant in, uh, as a building block of cities? Can it contribute to the making of public space and the public realm? And so let me, I think this cartoon, which is almost 30 years old, uh, tells uh, the story that we, as the tower emerged as the dominant building type, uh, we gave up the traditional urbanism of the 19th century and before and uh, the new dilemma of how is the tower deployed in the city. Uh, this echoes the many utopian projects of the 1920s and 30s of towers in the park. We all know how now we can be critical of how that was translated to public housing projects and other complexes. This is in New York, of course, Stuyvesant Town. Uh, I myself, uh, as a student, uh, traveled to visit high-rise developments in the United States and Canada. This was one of the many public housing projects that we visited. This was uh, early 1960s. And my uh, first project was trying to rethink the apartment building, I suppose I would say, from the inside out. Can apartments be rethought? So. Houses, uh, apartments can be thought of as houses, each with its own garden. Can corridors become streets? Can they be prefabricated again, and so on and so forth. Now, while it was a great success, it's there today, happily lived in, uh, it did not proliferate. And so about uh, 10 years ago, in a research fellowship in our office, we embarked on rethinking habitat to the densities of today, to the concept of mixed use, uh, to the issues of the public realm. Uh, this is the closet of many models and discarded schemes. Uh, I'll just hint at a few uh, because there were many responses to different issues of context, of culture, of climate, of density. But uh, here are some of the studies and I will focus on one that we took into more detail. We decided to pursue a study that tries to repeat or recreate the density of central Manhattan. Uh, the average FAR in central Manhattan used to be 12. I doubt that it's still true today, by the way. But it used to be 12. And we diagrammed this, uh, first showing the residential office and uh, retail, uh, as you see on the left, and on the right, the rearrangement of that with offices uh, occupying primarily the first 25 stories and the next 50 stories in this 75-story cluster being residential with a major community street at the 25th floor and public spaces on the ground. This is what it translated to. One of our objectives was to show that you can have very concentrated construction without creating a wall that if it's built along, a, uh, along the river or along Central Park for that matter, it would be permeable. 
Uh, the other objective was to create a maximum of, op to fractalize the building for maximum terracing, open space gardens, both for private use and communal use. You can see that at the 25th and uh, 50th level is, is communal use. And again, the permeability of the structure, and you see here the office buildings on one hand and the residential above. In the last uh, 10 years, these studies have spun off into projects that are now either complete or under construction. Qing Wandao, coastal city in China, uh, a complex which, again, because it's along the seashore, was able to convince the city uh, fathers and mothers, uh, mostly fathers in China, uh, that they could see uh, that the development of the city behind would not be blocked, that it could see through, so to speak. But uh, the building codes in, uh, in Qingwandao presented us with a fascinating challenge. Each apartment in this complex had to be exposed, had to have the benefit of three hours of sunlight measured in the winter solstice. Sounds like a simple little rule in the code book. We spent several months uh, rethinking and thinking over how to achieve that in reality, how to avoid having a single apartment on the north face of the building. It is just being completed as we speak, uh, many of the units benefiting from gardens and terraces, very generous on its communal space, both at the ground floor and the upper levels, and this is middle income housing. In Singapore, in the Bishan district, another project is just complete and people are moving in, which is again middle income housing, and that gives us a great deal of satisfaction that we can achieve this level of uh, quality of life within uh, for middle income housing. This is uh, 600 units, extremely concentrated. It is uh, not in the luxury downtown area. The idea is uh, to connect the, f the major, uh, the two towers with three levels of community activity. Uh, these three levels are public space, playgrounds, etc. In Singapore, unlike many North American locations, the majority of residents in such buildings would be families with children. These are buildings that accommodate family life. Uh, one of the bridges as it crosses uh, the uh, inevitable uh, infinity pool uh, on the roof of the structure. And uh, in uh, Colombo, a 65-story tower, I cannot testify to this being middle-income housing. Uh, it is not. Uh, but it is, uh, again, aiming to increase the quality of life within the structure to maximize public space, uh, etc. I'd like to move on, and here we get more culturally particular, uh, to the question of creating a meaningful, wholesome public realm uh, within the mixed-use uh, complexes that are rising now all over Asia, but also elsewhere in the world. And at random, we've just picked uh, a mixed-use recent project in Shanghai. Um, I don't even know the author, so I can't, you know, it's, I'm not trying to pick uh, uh, criticism, but it it's really is typical of hundreds of complexes of two or three towers of mixed-use sitting over a retail podium. And what is uh, uh, typical to all of these is that they're extremely introvert, they look onto themselves, they are not designed, by definition, to connect to the rest of the city. Often they are not even much related to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, street, street life around them. And I think it's worth reflecting on the more deep fundamental issue. I'm showing Pudong because I remember being in Shanghai in 1973, my first trip to China during the Cultural Revolution. There was not one high-rise building in Shanghai, not one high-rise building in Chongqing. Some of the cities we hear about today didn't even exist. So everything that we have seen in the way of tall buildings and, and, and high-density development has occurred in our lifetime, my lifetime, mostly uh, your lifetime. 
And uh, on the left, I've got uh, Richard Rogers' master plan uh, for Pudong. And you can, pick, you can pick at that, but there was a plan which tried to make the sum total of the individual developments greater than the parts. That all the individual pieces eventually would coalesce to make something very special uh, uh, place in the city. As it is, I think, whatever you think of the individual towers, it is a collection of projects, not an assemblage of city. In our own work, we've had a couple of opportunities to explore that. The first is Marina Bay Sands. I was often asked after we received the commission, why would you be interested in doing a casino? The reason we took on Marina Bay Sands primarily was because it was an opportunity to explore uh, what the public realm can be in a high-density mixed-use project. And the, uh, the, the, um, the seed of the concept of the project really came from the urban design guidelines uh, of the Urban Redevelopment Authority, which talked about the fact that the entire uh, perimeter of the newly formed bay and the Singapore River should be one continuous public space interconnected no matter who the, the individual developers are. Now I think it's a moment to actually recognize that one of the few places where uh, proactive urban design is occurring today in a way that tries to guide high-rise tower development is Singapore. Well, we took this as a springing point and organized our million square feet of retail, which luckily had a diverse program that included museums and theaters and convention facilities, into an indoor-outdoor, promenade on the water, air-conditioned mall, interwoven into new, some, new, some kind of a urban entity. And by definition, in each direction, it connects to the surrounding streets, bridges, etc. So it is a continuum of uh, the public network. All the facilities, particular facilities, plug into that spine. Very much, you could say, as in an old, in an ancient Roman city where the Cardo Maximus was the spine of life of the, of the city. You see here the indoor part of it. Uh, extending uh, both uh, in, in, in two directions, juxtaposed directly next to it and open to it to a series of promenades along the waterfront. This notion of creating public space then extends through the building. The entire roof of the, pod, of the podium part, which contains many of the public and retail facilities, is accessible public park space. And finally, on the roof of the hotel complex is a sky park with an observatory, uh, parks, et cetera, et cetera. Even the towers themselves in this particular case, the three hotels, uh, form an eight, a series of atria which are interconnected to each other and to the waterfront network. And that, these series of atria are open 24 hours a day, accessible to the public at large without restriction. So that too becomes part of the public realm of the project. The Sky Park uh, really tries to create mega open space in a situation where the density runs out of space on the ground. It's proven to be, uh, uh, there, there was a big discussion whether people would go up there to swim or whether they would go up there to uh, enjoy what it had to offer. Uh, it, it has proven to be a great attraction um, and most relevantly also recognized as part of the public realm that the public at large can go to. Currently under construction in Chongqing, uh, China, is a 10 million square foot complex. Uh, in this case, a mix of housing, primarily housing, office space, hotels, retail, some cultural facilities, and three major transportation nodes, the subway station, the central city bus terminal, and a shipping, uh, a passenger 
shipping terminal. Um, the uh, city uh, leaders and planners have been struggling with that site for some time. I suppose I would say it's the equivalent of Lower Manhattan. Uh, it is at the place of convergence of the Yangtze and the Jialing rivers. It is called the Emperor's Landing. It is where the city was founded. Uh, latching on to the theme of this being the sailing harbor uh, of the river system and sailboats having been part of the tradition, uh, we thought of the, of the clustering of the eight towers that emerged out of the program as a kind of a metaphor of sailboats. There are eight towers of mixed use sitting over a large podium which negotiates the city streets with the piazza, which currently, Great Plaza, which currently exists at the tip of the peninsula. There were no URA guidelines in Chongqing. Uh, what there was is two competitions in which the city rejected the submissions as being unsatisfactory. But there was no articulation of how that might connect to the city. And so we felt we need to come forward with such an articulation. And so we suggested uh, three, uh, three kind of urban design guidelines. One is that the city streets, the main city streets, which come from below, should go right through the project as they become pedestrianized, pedestrian streets and part of the retail life of the complex, so that they are thought of as an extension and a connector. Not unlike, uh, in a way, the Victoria Manuel Galleria in Milan, which connects you from the Scala Piazza to the Duomo Piazza, connecting two places in the city, these would go through and connect. The other criteria was that since the city level was about five levels higher than the perimeter at the river, we would then, as we uh, approached the project, uh, create a public park on the roof of the podium. So the green line represents a public park on the roof of the podium, as the red line represents pedestrian traffic that's moving through uh, from the city to the piazza and diagramming the mixed uses of residential, office, hotels, etc., which you see here, and crowned, in this case, not by a sky park, but by a conservatory. Uh, a conservatory really responding to the very particular climate of Chongqing. Uh, 40 degrees centigrade that summer, translating, I think, to 100 plus, and uh, actually cool winters, cold winters. So, and uh, not to mention a little bit of pollution. So uh, the, conservatory see, the conservatory seemed like a more appropriate response. And again, multiple public uses and also uh, hotel facilities. Facing south are mostly the residential development, enjoying the view of the city and uh, the sun coming from there. Facing north, primarily hotels and, um, and uh, the office buildings. And the uh, roof of the podium having bec will become totally accessible public park of, uh, of uh, two acres. The conservatory again. So I'd like to try and make some sense of that beyond just showing you some projects we're working on. I think that uh, though we've been building tall buildings, uh, for a hundred years, for a century. I don't think we have yet come to terms with how to make them building blocks of the urban environment. I think we're at the beginning of understanding that there are really t very difficult issues, it's issues of scale, issues of how the building comes to the ground, its sphere of influence. A tall tower has extraordinary sphere of influence in terms of shadow, in terms of views, in terms of um, so on and so forth, yet our tools of planning are totally inadequate. Uh, New York began with some daylight zoning probably 80 years ago of just trying to profile buildings. They were effective for a while, they completely became obsolete as the density quadrupled. If you think of what's happening in midtown Manhattan today, as we speak, then we're involved with one tower uh, on 29th Street, uh, as we created our model for our tower, 
four others sprouted within spitting distance away. So we are becoming conscious as we actually work on it on the extraordinary prolification of towers, which have a lot of impact on each other, yet there's no planning tool to put any sense of rationality into it. I think um, the other question is, how do we get the private sector developers to try uh, to think, to respond to the largest scale urban issues around their development? By definition, it's easier to consider the development as an introvert individual element, yet it cannot really be a friendly contributor to city life unless there are those concerns of connectivity um, come into play. And I don't think they can come from the developers themselves because they are, their interests are too, are too introvert. Um, I think that a public, the public realm by definition, needs to be accessible. I think it needs to be indoor and outdoor. I don't think it can be hermetically sealed. I think it needs to be diverse in the uses in it. It cannot be purely retail. It never has been in the past. And I think it needs to be accessible also in the sense that it is public, everyone has access to it, it is not restricted in any way. And that is something that needs to emerge out of a public understanding of the role of these buildings. So what are these new tools? I think that they mean that planning needs to be resurrected, or maybe urban design is a more uh, defining element, has to be resurrected as a respectable way of intervening in the city. In this country, certainly, we are coming out of decades of the market knows best. Planning has been discredited. Whatever planning took place in New York 30 years ago does not exist today in terms of uh, uh, interventionist, uh, regulatory planning that tries to guide urban growth. Uh, lots of talk about the High Line uh, in this conference. What fascinates me is that this beautiful re public resource is now being crowded side by side by a whole bunch of towers that want to be as close to it as possible. Has a city put in powerful guidelines that would create a building profile that would keep light and, and air around that high line as towers cluster around it? I suspect not. In fact, I know not. So this is one example where urban design needs to intervene to preserve something that we have.